Rover 200 VI, 0 to 60. Here we go. 30, 40, 50, 60. Okay. Welcome to Furious Driving, and I am very much enjoying driving in my Rover 200 VI, which is back on the road again. Um, many years ago, when I first started driving, my granddad said a thing to me, which is quite profound. You've passed your driving test now, now you can really start to learn to drive. And it's a lot like that when you recommission a car, put it back on the road. You do everything you need to do to get it back on the road, and once it's rolling, you start figuring out what's actually wrong with it. So there's really not a lot wrong with this 200VI now. Certainly far less was wrong than with Quentin, the convertible, when that car first came back on the road. It's really a little niggles. Um, one thing that was slightly worrying, the first time I drove the car, whoops, no, I've dropped it again. That bolt seems determined to be on the floor. The first time I drove this car was to the MOT, and the second time was when I drove it for that video of it, the first time I'm driving the car legally on the road. It was amazing. And that big uh, bolt, which has now disappeared under the chair, here we go, um, fell on the floor. I spent a long time looking around the engine bay of this car to figure out where that came from, and I cannot see anywhere that that can have fallen out of, so I can only assume that sometime previously when this car was worked on, that wasn't put back and a replacement went in, that's all I can assume. So I'm not worried about that anymore. Um, what I am concerned about are the following things. First of all, the tracking is completely skew -if. Second, we've got our indicators, which sometimes work, sometimes don't work. The hazard lights, which are on the same haphazard, hiding to nothing. And the great thing about a channel like this is people comment with their experiences, and it would appear, they're working right now, um, that either the relay or the hazard light button is gonna be at fault. The easiest thing to do is to pop the hazard light button out and clean up the internals of that. So I'll do that first of all before I buy a new relay. And even then, that's only a tenner off eBay. So yeah, that should not be too expensive of a fix. So we'll lay into that one. Uh, thirdly, the radio. Um, you may have noticed in videos of this car, the radio is protruding from the dashboard somewhat. Uh, it doesn't work. It turns on to the point that the light comes on, or the backlighting of the screen comes on, but it doesn't actually have a built-in screen. It uses a screen that's up on the top of the dashboard, which is also the clock, um, and that screen is completely dead. So I don't know if that's related or not, but you turn it on, and what would normally happen is you enter a code for the first time when you power the car up from a fresh battery, it takes the code, it remembers that forever, and you just use the radio. However, if you get the code wrong, you get a certain tone, and then the radio locks itself. And all I'm getting is I'm turning it on, wait a couple of seconds, push any button, you get that tone, and then the thing powers down. So possibly I need to be fixing that screen. I don't know, and maybe that will fix it. But in the meantime, though, I did try this old Sony, which powered up briefly and it worked fine. But like the uh, 420 GSI, it then stopped working and then suddenly I've got a radio which as far as I'm aware is working completely fine, but now won't power up even a little bit. And uh, the radio which has gone back in the dashboard is the broken Rover one, which uh, as it did before, backlight powers up, then the thing turns itself off and we're back to square one. So radio needs sorting out before any long journeys because that's just miserable driving in silence. And finally, thing to sort out on this car in the immediate future, certainly before I drive it again, last night I didn't really feel like watching TV, I didn't want to do any work. I didn't film it because it was just driving for me. I thought I'd take this car out for a little drive around the lanes, have a bit of fun just cruising around in it. And it was lovely, really was nice. What I did notice though when I got back was an overwhelming stench of brakes because the near side front brake caliper must have been binding as it said in the um, MOT. The I'd kind of hoped that the, that binding, which you really can't feel when you're driving, it was just holding the pads on enough to make it stink and the wheel and disc were really, really hot. So yeah, first thing I'm going to be doing before I do anything else is getting that caliper off. Maybe I can free it. Maybe I can just uh, clean up the, um, the slide pins and we'll be okay. We'll avoid buying a new caliper. Let's hope so, because, you know, I don't want to spend too much more money on the car. Well, I'm in the car park having just definitely not stopped to go and buy a couple of Hot Wheels cars, RX-7 and a Defender double cab. You've seen nothing. And just noticed in the footwell of the car, this, which looks suspiciously like the uh, courtesy like door jam switch, was lying on the carpet. Looked inside the door jam, and look what's there. A hole where a door jam switch should be. 
No evidence of a wire though. That is really odd. Okay, that's gonna take a bit of fiddling to get that one sorted out. Hmm, crochet hook anyone? And we're back from our little drive out and yeah, once again, that side is painfully hot to the touch. Nip around this side, it's warm, not hot. So now the first thing you need to do before you do anything else when you're taking suspension components apart, smother everything you can undo in a little bit of bulldog and then go and grab yourself a cup of tea for a few minutes while it uh, does its work. And hopefully it'll be as good as it was when we did the uh, 400 and its brake caliper because that just unwound like it wasn't even tight. Now, as always, I'll do the general and usual advertising and disclaimers. The car is on an axle stand and a jack, so it's not gonna go anywhere. It's nice and safe. Um, if you wanna get yourself a nice Furious Driving hat, a Furious Driving mug, or many other odds and sods, head over to Furious Driving in the link in the description. And all the tools I'm using today, all this Draper stuff, the jack, the stands, the sockets, even this really cool tray for putting all your sockets on together, are all on my Amazon affiliate link. Which if you head over to that, buy anything off Amazon, that does help support the channel and keep this nonsense going. Now I'm not gonna slacken off the uh, brake flexi because I'm hoping not to be removing that today. What size am I looking for here? Probably looking for a 14, I think, or a 13. There we go, yep. Let's go with a, a breaker bar on this one. Wow, okay. <laughs> Bulldog, you are the best. I don't know how they do it, I don't know what's in it. But this caliper has been on here a number of years, driving through the, the British weather and that just cranks straight off, no bother. I've said this before, I'm not sponsored by Bulldog. I'm just using their stuff and I'm blown away with it. I need a bar thing, you know what I mean. Pry bar, you knew I meant pry bar, didn't you? Again, this set, along with everything else I'm using, is over on the furiousdriving.co. Yeah, they've seen Amazon affiliate link. Even though I don't even know what I'm advertising anymore. Oh man alive. So the pads have stayed put. These discs are pretty nastily worn, but as I mentioned in the previous video, I am looking at changing these as soon as possible. Now these pins come out, yeah, they do. Pretty black and manky. Let's give some new grease on that. Ooh. This is one of those rare occasions where I'm actually using brake clean for actually what it's intended for. Who knew? Yeah, give it a bit of a... And what I'll do, I'll put this all back together, take it for a couple of days driving, to see if it's improved or not. If it has, happy days. If not, then obviously I'll have to go and order up a new caliper. So this is pretty thick with scunge. That yellow gunge looked like the wrong colour for this, to be honest. So I wonder if someone's used the wrong goop on it at some point in the past. Now while I'm here doing this on the 200VI, behind the camera is Hippo the Freelander, which I took out on Monday with uh, Furious Junior and Mrs Furious, because this is as yet untried, didn't know what to expect from this on a family day out, so I didn't want to risk that and uh, incur the wrath, because you know what it's like, take your wife out in their car, it fails, then you're never allowed to use that for family day out again. Hippo has proved himself time and time again, and guess what? Something started going grindy in the brakes. I'm hoping it's either something uh, caught in one of the brakes or a frozen caliper, a bit like this really, because it was getting worse and worse as it got hotter and hotter, and it got worse as the car sped up. So I'm pretty sure it's brakes, but fortunately that car proved itself, and so is no longer isn't on the hit list of cars we can't go in because it's deemed unsafe. It's just got a minor, minor problem I need to fix, and that'll be next time. Ugh. Right, let's find the correct kind of goo to put on those sliders. Right, that's, oops. Right, these have now got, oops, some, a uh, bit too much actually in that case. Uh, brake uh, grease, specific brake grease on these. Well, yep. There goes a disc, a pad, whatever it's called. Yep, they move. Oh dear. Nicely, I think. Feel pretty nice and squishy. Pads can go back on. The pads have got a fair bit of meat in them. Slide back in there. I need to go and get my uh, G clamp to squish that back in so I can wind it back in there. 
there is actually a proper tool for doing this and one day I'll go and buy one but in the meantime <laughs> an old G-clamp does do the trick surprisingly well for winding a caliper back in there it goes again now given the age and condition of this caliper compared to the one I changed on the other side it's possible I might be changing this one fairly soon as well but if I can avoid spending those few pounds I'll be very 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 happy indeed to do so let's quickly whack this up tight well that's certainly moving nice and easy on the uh, sliders now so let's hope it's enough to get the thing fixed and not have to me buy a new caliper and that's one job done crossed off the list click right done at least it'll come off easy if i have to undo it again in a few weeks time right so on the test drive to see if that has made any difference or not don't forget when you do test drive after any brake work before you leave the drive push the brakes a few times to make sure they are working again because the first couple of stabs are often nothing under your foot whatsoever so don't get caught out by that important top tip a safety thing um, so we'll just put it down the road a mile or two and then uh, pull over and see how warm it is compared to the other one I'm anticipating one or two people saying the reason the car is pulling to the left is because that brake was snatching but the brake doesn't feel like it's snatching and it is still pulling to the left so I will run this down and get the uh, tracking done very soon indeed. Look at these lovely new Falcon tyres on there. I don't want them to be uh, scrubbed before I've driven the car any miles. Nice and cool, barely feel it to the touch. Passenger side, tiny bit warmer than it already was. Might be okay, we'll give it a bit more of a longer drive soon, but I'm gonna call that a win for now. Now, I didn't fit this when I got it at the same time as the head gasket set, because I assumed there's going to be some drilling and measuring and kerfuffle. Turns out it's an absolute doddle, because you use the existing bolts and things that are fitting into the car. You start off by undoing the middle of these three wing bolts. So inside here, we've got a fitting kit for this car, which contains, let's have a look, a ball stud. We've got two brackets for the top and it says fit the ball stud do not fit the washer on the mg 225 or zr this is a 200 so i will not hit not fit the washer okay as you insist i need a spanner now now out comes the bonnet top bolt and we've got two of these so which one do i fit and you use on the 25 and 200, the uppermost one. That fits like that, apparently. All right, and repeat on the other side. Right, let's make sure this closes without fouling. Yep, all good. If I can find my little knife, we can fit the struts. Right, now these are quite tight, so it's easier to fit the bottom first. And then lift the bonnet up to that, rather than the other way around. So I fit again, fit the bottom first. Lift the bonnet and snap it in. Job done. And these are rather nice. Dark Ice Designs lift struts are now on the car, thanks to uh, discount MG Rover Supplies. Let's have a look at it. Oh, nice. That's one thing you really didn't notice when you use an old car versus a new car. You do if you... Ah, superb. So now we've got proper luxury on this because we've got the heated washer jets and now we've got lift struts as well. Fantastic. Should I go all branded and put these on the um, on the side? I think I shall. As soon as I gave the stickers, let's put the stickers on the side. Got a 
got the stickers on stuff, haven't you? That is a properly nice touch. And since we've got the bonnet up, I'm going to refit this to that little trim cover here, which I never did after the uh, head gasket gubbins. Again, just making the whole thing look and feel a little bit nicer. And do things properly and all that. Now, last off, we're going to hit all the low hanging fruit here. Going to try and take out this hazard warning light switch, which is currently working. Of course, it is. And uh, give that a clean up. Incidentally, why do Rover heater knobs always wind up only going a third of their full distance? The 400 is exactly the same as this, only goes a little way, doesn't go all the way to cold, doesn't go all the way to hot. Very weird. And also, this panel here looks like it has either been levered out or the glue has given up on it. So it's poking forwards, and I'm not quite sure how to change that. If the clips have broken, if I need to go and get a new one. Anyway, the internet says, and the internet's never wrong, you can lever this out with a pair of uh, screwdrivers, flatheads. So we'll give that a whirl. Let's have a crack at this. Let's get a couple of screws and drivers in there. See if this does just pop out as advertised. Oh, it does, don't you? Oh, don't go losing yourself in there. Need you not to get lost. That would be a bad thing. Already it's lost. Let's get some pliers. All right, okay. So you need to not do that again. And I've just found the little screw that holds the door jam light switch in place. I'll put that down there. I'll go and get my endoscope thing later and see if I can find the wire for that. That's going to be impossible to sort out. Now, people have said, just take this switch apart and clean inside, but, yeah, I'm not quite sure how you do that. I suppose you can press those in there and then release that, but it looks like it's going to break it up some more. What I'm going to do, less destructively, is take out the little light bulb and use a bit of contact cleaner inside there. Because electrical contact cleaner is the best. Saves all manner of switches. I'm just going to do some more of this. Let it rattle around in there. I saved all the window switches on my old E30 BMW once just by doing this. You never know, this might save me having to go and buy a new relay. Let's hope so. It still works. I'm not sure the light's coming on anymore. Might need a new bulb for it. Just checking, because I'm sure this light was coming on before. Yeah, that should be working. Let's put it back in and try again. So, uh, one step forward, two steps back. I can't tell if this is an improvement or not, because it was working as a switch before I took it all apart. Um, so, let's hope it's all good now. I'll, I'll give it a bit of dousing of... Uh, Contact cleaner, and, oops, contact cleaner in there as well. Because contact cleaner solves all ills. Um, but yeah, the light was working in that switch previously. I've now disturbed something and it isn't, even though the bulb is working. So well done me. Two steps forward, one step back. Uh, I'll order a new bulb. I've cleaned it up with a little tiny bit of sandpaper just to kind of tidy it all up. I'll leave the switch slightly proud so I can take it out again. What have we got left to fix in this car? Tracking still needs doing. I probably am going to have to change that brake caliper in the near future. This radio, I don't even know where to go with that. That's just a massive pain in the bottom. I just need to give thing a bit more of a drive and then change the oil again in uh, a few weeks' time. Well, a few hundred miles' time. Just to kind of keep flushing that uh, system through. Oh yeah, I need to work out why this is poking forward. If anyone has any clues about that, then let me know. It would be nice to have a, a heater that went all the way to hot and all the way to cold as well. Because that's going to get old fast. Hmm, okay. So a few more little improvements here on the 200 VI. It's getting better and better. Oh, and also that armrest has collapsed. I'm gonna have to take that panel off and rebuild that underneath that with some glass fiber or something. Oh, I've just noticed this as well. So I'm gonna get some spray and fix that right now. That's why I hadn't noticed that before. I hadn't flipped. Unfortunately, I've got lots and lots of this stuff left over from when I did the uh, headlining on the Volvo. There we go. Hopefully that's one more fix for the lift done. 
So like on the 400, which is another source of issues for me, um, this was working. It, it powered up absolutely fine. I've got radio stations, you could play the CD. It's actually got a uh, quite decent uh, disc in there that I did not realise I'd left in it. But yeah, now it's absolutely dead. I don't know what the problem is. I was going to say, do I need a specific uh, R8 and R3 loom? But clearly not, because it was working. We just need to go and get another radio, yet another radio to try. I don't know. Even if I'm sat in the car and I've got tools and a test meter and stuff, I will stop prodding stuff. Turns out I've got 12 volts on the permanent and the switched, all the way to the radio, and everything appears to be correct, going into the right ports. But the radio was working, and now it's not. Maybe the radio is broken. I need to go and get one of the many others from the barn and the uh, the 400 tourer. Oh well, I'll leave that here. Thank you for watching, I hope you've enjoyed. If you have, as always, please do hit like and subscribe. If you like the look of any of the tools apart from this old ancient test meter that I've been using on the channel, and please do head over to my Amazon affiliate link shop where they are available and making a purchase from there, or even just clicking that link does help the channel. And if you like the look of a furious driving ah, hat, red, black, or gray, blue, yellow, t-shirts, stickers, and more, key rings and badges, head over to furiousdriving.co.uk and join me again next time when I'll be doing something on a different car, which is not this one, something completely different, as I always say. Thanks for watching and see you again soon, and hopefully my cold will have gone by then as well.